So welcome everybody. This is the uh, general interest webinar called Visualizing Job Properties for Wait Time Assessment. So this is part of the uh, SharkNet general interest webinar series, about an hour presentation that happens every two weeks on Wednesdays, where staff kind of come up with an idea of uh, some things that are happening that might be valuable for researchers to know. So this session is actually uh, inspired by the last general interest webinar, where uh, Jin Wei uh, presented on using uh, Jupyter Lab and uh, different notebook strategies from the compute systems. Uh, so my name is James Desjardins. I work on the national scheduler team. I often support researchers who are experiencing wait times that are unpredictable, um, but I also do a lot of assessment in the background of accounts that are experiencing wait times for perhaps unexpected and, and often unexplained reasons. And in doing those assessments, we often use uh, various notebooks and a couple of Python packages that we're developing now, uh, but we've typically been doing it on, on sort of engineered data structures that we have in the background and a specific virtual machine for doing it. And it's been my intention for a long time uh, to try and build some notebooks that I could use directly on the clusters uh, querying the live scheduler uh, to get to be using the very sort of current state of the system to do these assessments. But the other thing that I really want to do uh, with that is if I'm running these assessments on the compute clusters themselves, an interactive job, uh, I'd be doing it exactly like uh, the research community would would need to do it. So what I've done in, in uh, the past little while since being inspired by Jimmy is I created a little notebook and I've taken some of the tools that we usually use on, on the specific machines using other data structures to assess these wait times. And I've started um, modifying it so that researchers can just do these assessments themselves from an interactive job on the cluster. So this presentation is, you know, it's basically about the kind of assessment that we do, looking at um, job properties. Now, I would I would love to go further into detail about uh, sort of an explicit documented series of a, of assessment uh, criteria to go through, um, and I think I might do that soon. But this one is really just about starting up these tools, running a notebook that queries job records. Uh, plotting the time series, but also plotting scatter plots uh, to see if there are job properties that have uh, unusual wait times. So that's that's really what today is about. So no further ado, I'll just I'll just get into it. Um, so the overview is we'll just go through a bit of the scheduling and account usage states. So we'll be talking about. Um, uh, how accounts achieve throughput and what the expected throughput is, and uh, how we visualize sort of the expected throughput. And with the expected throughput, an account can end up in different states where it's you know, way above its expected uh, usage or it's below its expected usage, but still but trying to get things and experiencing wait times. And we refer to those as pain states. Those are really uh, the states that all of these tools are designed to uh, first of all, identify, but now kind of get into the, the nitty gritty about assessing why that pain is happening. So what we're really looking to do uh, is establish uh, common ways uh, to assess unexpected wait times. So some wait times are, are completely expected. If your account has a specific throughput or a target share, uh, regardless of how many resources you have queued um, in, in, in the scheduler queue, um, you can only run a certain amount at a time in theory in order for there to be a fair share. Then we'll talk about what's called the, uh, the show jobs notebook and the repository that it's at. Uh, and then finally, we'll go over uh, running the notebook uh, particularly from the interactive job that's right on the uh, cluster. Okay, so measuring the job usage and the queue load. So jobs request a reservation 
um, of a set of resources. And the jobs request was reserved uh, during runtime uh, and sit pending uh, during a queue time. So one of the very first visualizations um, that that I find useful is is this uh, visualization of all these job records here. So the main issue that I'm dealing with whenever I'm trying to assess wait times is if I queue uh, all of the jobs. Uh, from S account on the cluster, I basically get a table and that table has one row per job where I get the job ID, get a start time, an end time, submit time, uh, things like elapsed, number of cores, the amount of memory and things like this. But what I actually want to get are different summaries that tell me how those jobs are experiencing wait time over a period of time. So in this first image, uh, up here, each job is a rectangle that's just stacked one on top of another. The gray areas correspond to the period of time. So the, the x-axis is, is date time. The gray areas correspond to the period of time that a job waited in the queue. The green area corresponds to the period of time that a job was running. And then the blue area afterwards corresponds to the amount of time uh, that was reserved that's left over after the job ends. Now, what we can do with these plots then is then we can just sum up all of the time when jobs were running. And then we can plot the time series of, of stuff that's running. So in the second plot, the dark blue line corresponds to how much the account had running at any time. But the other thing that we can do with these plots is we can assess how many resources the account had uh, pending or waiting in queue. And that's what this light blue line is. So over this period of time here, this account had a lot of resources waiting uh, and relatively little running at that time. So the thing about expected wait times is this gray area corresponds to this account's fair share of the system. If it's a allocation account, this is basically the awarded allocation. If it's a default account, it's basically the equal share of uh, the unallocated resources across all default accounts. So, what we actually expect is that regardless of how many resources are queued at any time, the, the actual usage, the dark blue line will average out to that uh, gray area over time. So in that way, we would say that this, this isn't necessarily an unexpected uh, uh, pending queue load because it's so high uh, above the, uh, the fair share usage of that account. Okay. So what ends up happening is accounts end up being in different states. And the specific state that I wanna talk about uh, is, is the pain state here. So this is a state whenever resources uh, are queued, but not running at the target share while the account is still below the cumulative target. So here's an example right here where the account has pending resources, but the dark blue is still flat. So this, this account has things in the queue, but nothing is running and it just stays there for uh, an extended period of time. Now, importantly, if we take the cumulative sum of the usage of an account, we would sort of expect that the target share kind of goes up on this, on this horizontal or this diagonal line. And so the usage would, it, would it vary if everything is fine around that line. But we can see here that this account fell way below the target share cumulatively, but it's still experiencing pain. That is, it has things queued and not running. 
So this pain state is typically the state that an account is in whenever we get support tickets um, asking for an explanation about why jobs are pending in the queue and not running. What staff are doing in the background now is we're monitoring all of the accounts on the system to uh, basically rank order uh, accounts that are in a state like this, where there's a lot of resources pending within the expected throughput of the account. The account is still you know, below its, its target share, but those resources are pending. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to rank order those and then establish a process for describing why, what, what properties of the system or properties of jobs that are pending are resulting in this state. So I've been working uh, with different Python tools and building notebooks to try and visualize this because doing it from the table output of um, the S account call um, is, is very difficult to assess. So what's next? So what, what we want to be able to do is, uh, is assess unexpected wait times. So expected wait times can occur for several identifiable reasons. So here's an example of an account that we'll look at uh, in the tools in a bit. And what we see is you know, this, this account has a target share about there. It's often active. It seems to be able to just start jobs without waiting. But then all of a sudden here, a bunch of resources got queued and didn't run for what looks like several days. Then everything was normal for a while. And then all of a sudden it happened here again. And what we want to do is be able to identify these. So whenever we look at this, at this top figure that shows the usage and the queued relative to the target, we can see when it, it looks like there's a problem. Now, what, what we're doing with the added figures. So from this figure, we can basically tell that there is an issue. There's, there's pain being experienced here and there's pain being experienced here, but we, we don't know why it was happening. So if we look down here, this is a scatter plot where each point represents a single job and the y-axis here is the wait time that the job experienced and then the x-axis is the submit time no, it's not really there. okay and what we see is that this period here and this period here correspond to two jobs one there and one there now these these points are colored based on which partition they were in and the system partitions uh, basically restrict the amount of resources that jobs have access to based on on different uh, size properties in the jobs so one of the major ones is the duration of the job or the time limit and what we see here is that these are actually um, seven day jobs that were requested now, at that same time, there may have been other jobs that, that started fine. So for example, down here, there, there are a bunch of these red jobs that were a shorter period. But these two experienced long wait times, and those two jobs account for all the pain that was experienced there. And what we end up finding is that because these were uh, requesting uh, seven uh, day run times, they actually correspond uh, to a reservation that was put on the system because of a known uh, system uh, maintenance downtime. So this is, this is one of those um, issues where these jobs had to stay pending in the queue because at that time there was a, a system downtime uh, scheduled to happen with a reservation. So seven days before that downtime, those jobs were not allowed to start because that would allow them to get killed by the downtime. No. 
so there's other types of of uh, of wait times that are that are kind of funny and and counterintuitive. Um, we'll also look at this example whenever I get over to the notebook, where um, an account is experiencing pain, but if we take a look at well, it's it's experiencing pain from the initial view of having resources queued. Um, but the wait time here is actually in eligible resources. And what ends up happening is that even though the account, whenever we look at it later, has a whole bunch of, of pending resources at this time, um, the eligible wait time is still basically zero during this entire period. So what we can do here is we can actually plot the difference between um, the submit time and when it became eligible. And then what we see here is that the population of jobs typically had a, an eligible delay uh, in, in sort of a, a distribution of values up to 50 hours. So the way that these jobs were uh, submitted either through arrays or dependencies would result in these big serial farms to have jobs that would not be eligible for up to two days at a time. Now, in, and the other thing is in these, we see that same, that same instance that happened in the previous example um, where there's a job only in a, in a long queue um, that got affected by the, the planned downtime. Okay, so what we're really going to look at, the, the figures that I was just talking about in terms of assessing things comes from this uh, show jobs notebook I tried to put together um, and, and set it up based on Jimmy's uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago. So the show use notebook repo contains uh, tools for querying job records from the system slurm scheduler and provides some interactive visualizations. So the repository is README, uh, which I just put together, uh, contains the instructions for you know just getting the repo onto the system, installing the requirements, setting up the virtual environment, uh, as well as the kernel, starting the interactive uh, notebook job, uh, and then tunneling to the compute node. So whenever you're using this um, this notebook, you'll actually be on a compute node with a certain amount of memory. Um, and, and other resources that you want. And then you'll be querying the active scheduler on that cluster. Uh, and then finally navigating to the notebook uh, from a browser. So in a nutshell, what I'm gonna go into now is really a, the demonstration of, of using one of these notebooks to assess uh, job properties and wait times. So in the background here, I just provided the example of once the system is once um, once you have the notebook on the system, you run an interactive job, and then you basically run your notebook script, which uh, provides uh, the address and token that you're then able to um, browse to in a browser, and then you can just start running uh, the code blocks and then generate generating the interactive uh, figures over there. So I think what I'll do now is I will just bring up, I think, yeah. What I'll do now is I will bring over um, a couple of examples of this. So here we have now the, the interactive, this is the actual uh, show jobs notebook. It starts off with just loading importers. So it uses view plus package um, that the, the data analytics national team in the Alliance uh, is working on. A couple other things, it sets some parameters. So basically we end up querying an account name uh, over a period of time. The, uh, whenever it's measuring the usage, it's doing it in core equivalents, which is, is basically the, 
the billing metric for uh, usage on the system. Uh, and then you also provide the uh, basically the target share that the account has. This command here will then just create the jobs data frame. The jobs data frame is is really it's 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 just the sort of the formatted table um, that we see whenever uh, you do a call of s account on the system, uh, and it's just in a, a pandas data frame. So there's some. There's some engineered variables like the eligible delta hours, which is the difference between when a job was submitted and when it became eligible. But you have all of the things like the job ID, uh, the start and the end time, and the time limit. And then eventually there's, there's other things like uh, the number of cores, the amount of memory, et cetera. So we also provide a couple of things. So we can then just save these uh, job records uh, to data frames, and what I'm I'm going through the process of doing is is basically creating examples of certain types of of uh, of of, uh, of account states for usage, and then including them there. So I think right now I have an instance open where there's uh, dependencies uh, for the jobs. So if I, I just ran that, showed them, and then you can also just uh, read the specific um, job data frames from a pickle file that's saved. Okay, so this command creates what's called the job stack. The job stack is the figure that we were looking at before, uh, where each job, uh, rather than just being a line in a table, is presented as a rectangular object, and we can zoom into this, uh, corresponding to when it was submitted and then uh, when it ran. So we can take a look at little chunks of time here. So over this period of time, so on June 15th, several jobs were submitted at the same time. They all became pending. And then what you see here in basically a, a, um, a dependent farm, one job started. So this job goes green, it ends, and then the next one is able to start. And then that ends, the next one's able to start. So although there are a whole bunch of jobs in queue at this time, this, the way that each job starts after the previous one ends is a good indication that these had dependencies on each other and weren't actually eligible to run at the beginning. Now, and then at the end, there's some kind of uh, cancellation where the rest of the jobs uh, end. This sort of thing can also be uh, an issue. Um, for example, if the account storage quota got exceeded and then the rest of the jobs just start and end or a file system problem, uh, things like that. So this, this view of, you know, basically when the jobs were submitted and when they ran over the entire uh, allocation period, you can get a sort of, you can just get a visualization of when things happened, how long things took, sort. And then we can also see the periods of time when there was a lot waiting uh, and, and when there were things running. So if I take a closer look at here, we can see a lot gets submitted. And then as these jobs run, and they sort of run at about the rate of the accounts allocation, that's taking more and more jobs out of the queue until eventually they just, they just drop off and then it tails off. So if we look at the cumulative sum, of these jobs, we get a figure that looks like this. So if the account had basically been running its allocation the entire time, the blue line would follow this uh, diagonal target share. But early on, around, we'll say, May here, the usage sort of dropped away from the target. And it was doing a bit of catching up again on the queue. 
Now, although it looks like this account had been experiencing a lot of wait times, you know, even though it was below the, the target share of the system, if we look at a scatter plot here of all of the jobs, in this figure, we're plotting. Uh, so this is the actual eligible wait time. So how long a job waited once it was eligible in hours. And then what we see is that, you know, since May, whenever this account kind of started looking like it was a problem, the, the eligible wait times were actually zero the entire time. So this sort of account um, ends up kind of not being uh, flagged unless it was accidental um, that basically these resources are waiting because the, the resources um, are actually um, in, in not eligible state, so queued dependently in some way. Now, this, this notebook is, is designed to try and uh, be able to, to plot any variables of the job records. So the most valuable way that I've been finding is, is plotting the color as the partition uh, that, it, uh, that it was deployed to, plotting the uh, wait time on the y-axis, and then keeping the actual submit time as the X so that we can relate it back to uh, the actual pain durations that we saw above. But there, the, the notebook is intended to be that you can sort of build scatter plots out of any properties or combinations of, of job properties that you want. For example, this, this second one here is, is is an initial draft of what's called the, the memory delta. So the memory delta is the amount of memory that was requested by the job um, um, minus the, the maximum pooled memory uh, seen by the scheduler. So max RSS is something that's returned by S account in the job steps. And one of, one of the, the sort of known partition issues that results in increased wait time is if you request a lot of memory and get bumped over to the large memory nodes. Now, if this were the case, so for example, if all of these jobs had long wait times, this would also mean that perhaps what you can do is you can reduce the amount of memory that those jobs were asking for, because the y-axis in this figure corresponds to how much over-requesting of memory happened in those jobs. So that's, that's one of the, the larger factors of things that we can do to uh, reduce wait times, is try and get the most accurate memory requests. Um, a similar figure can be made where we're looking at the delta of the actual runtime. So if you're requesting seven days, but jobs always run within three days, um, this, this sort of figure would help you identify those by doing the, the time delta instead of the memory delta. And then down at the bottom is, is just the eligible delta. So how, plotting how long jobs uh, we're in the queue, but not eligible to run. So I think maybe what I will do here is I think I'll just give an example of running running another one. So maybe what I'll do is so what I can do. Um, once we, we start storing specific uh, job samples, I can just load a new one in. So here I'm going to uh, load up the example of identifying the downtime in the system. So that one just ran. And then I can do the shift enter on the job stack, which will update this figure. And then we can look into uh, how the jobs 
ran. Yep, so just looking at the question in chat. So, so the memory delta plots, plot shows deltas between memory asked, memory used after jobs have run. Yep, so in the job completion records, um, you end up with a value for each step called max RSS. Now, it's very important to understand the limitations of max RSS. So one of the things that I wish that we can do is provide a way to have a very accurate representation of how much memory was actually used by each job. And this is something that we're working on creating data structures for. The max RSS returned in job completion records is the maximum memory that the scheduler saw during any of its polls during the job execution time. Now, that means that it often actually misses when the job was at its maximum. Um, so it's not the actual maximum, it's the pulled maximum. So oftentimes, even whenever you have a job that gets killed because it runs out of memory, the max RSS is really low because the job will be running at low memory. It'll spike quickly, which will trigger the out of memory uh, kill of the job, but the scheduler will not have ever caught the increase in the memory. So it's really just the first look, but we wanna make sure that these tools, so that, that figure, the, the memory delta figure, is one that we would love to have with a very accurate representation of how much memory was used in the system. Okay, so here's here's the the sample of of an account that experienced uh, wait time. I'm just going to run a couple more cells. So this this top cell creates what's called the job stack, where you can you can take a look at uh, the actual series of the jobs. And I'll just take a little bit closer look here. And there's basic, there is two problem areas. There's one over here and then one over there, I think. And so this is another thing that happens frequently. We have a bunch of jobs that are all running in short periods of time, but then all of a sudden you get one that takes a very long time. And this is, this is often um, what, what causes confusion. Let me just take a close look here. Right. So this is one of those situations where a whole bunch of jobs are submitted here, and then they start running and ending in a regular interval, but then all of a sudden there's a very long wait time for one of the jobs. And this, this is a bit uh, confusing. So the next block, what this one does is it actually calculates the usage time series as well as the uh, queued time series so that uh, you can then plot um, this, what's called the insta plot. So it's the instantaneous usage and queued resources at any time. So because this one had a huge burst, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, so this is a job that had a very unexpected wait time over here around uh, June 23rd, which is actually related to um, uh, uh, a known downtime that impacted this account because uh, the, the time requests were very long. So the job couldn't start uh, as of seven days before um, the, uh, the reservation was happening. So what we can do here is we can then, now that we have this example of the jobs data frame um, for the, the downtime sample, we can then just uh, run this scatter plot. That's going to plot the submit time on the X 
the eligible wait hours on the Y, and it's going to color it based on the partition. So this one, we tend to know if we look in the, the histograms, we're looking for if there's anything noticeable about the jobs that end up being higher on the y-axis. Oftentimes what we find is that this will be a, a, a partition, uh, either one of the, the largest partitions in terms of duration. So that's what the B4 corresponds to in this case. So this one is also requesting a single node. Um, I don't know if I have the CPUs in there or not. Okay. So if you aren't using samples, um, if, if, if you go and you get this notebook, typically what happens is you find a period of time where your account is, uh, is you have a wait time. It's difficult. So you just, um, just going to clear this output because it tends to cause delays. So just put the account name that you want to query here the period of time and then the uh, measurement that you want to do it by. So the, the CPU equivalent is what the schedule understands. And then for a default account, um, uh, a share of 50 core equivalents is typical. So I just updated that. And then what I can do is now that I've updated the account name and the start time, I can perform the query. So this will now create a new data frame based on the parameters here and this is based on the scheduler um, on the system that i'm actually in oh right so this is funny whenever we're talking to the scheduler uh, we always need to have the cpu or gpu uh, underscore um, uh, specified whenever we're submitting jobs um, we just have to say the def jdjr username. Um, but in the scheduler itself, the underscore CPU gets appended based on the resources that we're asking for. It could also be the GPU. Um, but whenever we're asking uh, for jobs from an account, uh, we have to actually specify that. Okay. So what happens here is now the jobs data frame is um, the current state of this of the system that I'm on, and this notebook is on the Gram system. So I can just run this to get a view of the table. So I can see when I submitted the jobs. And that's just a view of the table that's sort of augmented from what we would see in the terminal with um, uh, S Act, and then. What I can do here is then just run this and then it will, it will show me the work that I was doing. So early in July, I was, I was testing some jobs and you can see I submitted this very large job at one point that waited for a while. But let's just look at what I was doing in the last couple of days. We can basically see this, this was me uh, testing these jobs, these interactive jobs for running this process with one hour interactive jobs, it would pretty much start right away. And then these are these like three hour interactive jobs and I was running. And then from there with the job stack, you can just go through, calculate the time series, you can plot uh, the instantaneous, and then you can just modify these scatter plots to uh, display the job records, trying to identify uh, which property of the job records might be resulting in a longer wait time. Now, I think the only other thing that I would like to uh, demonstrate is just the extension from uh, Jin Lee's uh, presentation on, 
and how we actually uh, go about doing this. So at this point, if anybody has any questions about the assessment type, uh, we can do that. And then I'll just go into actually starting up this, this notebook um, so that people can see uh, the process for doing that. Okay, so I'm just gonna use the actual setup from uh, the Git repository here and then bring up a new terminal. So the setup really involves going to the cluster, going to the project directory for the account name, uh, cloning the repo, and then going into that directory. So you load the couple modules like the Python, and then you create the virtual environment, source it, and then this is just explicitly installing uh, the dependencies for running this. And then we actually create here the Python kernel uh, for doing the show jobs um, notebook. This last part, and this is documented uh, in uh, the Jupyter uh, wiki page uh, for the Alliance for Compute Canada about creating the uh, interactive um, notebook or the basically the notebook script for the interactive job making that executable. So once you do this once, uh, after that, it's just a matter of doing this interactive job. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through this process. Canada.ca. So I'm going to get my thing in the room. Right. Okay. And I'll go to my project directory. Launch jobs. So in here is where I have all this. Oh yeah. So can we see jobs that have not run yet on the graphs in these notebooks? Yes. So this is one of the main reasons why I want to move the, the entire assessment process that we do. Typically, other data structures that we use uh, for staff in the background are job completion records. But oftentimes, what we want to know is the state of currently running or currently pending jobs. And we're building some new data structures that track that sort of thing. But whenever we go onto the cluster itself, we schedule and we query the live scheduler. What, the, the jobs data frame contain the current pending and running jobs as well. So oftentimes there's, there's a different interpretation um, of the period of time when you do the query that the, the time series will actually uh, show what's basically called the, the horizon of all the usage. That if you have a bunch of jobs pending, it will show if all of those pending resources start right whenever you queued how long their time requests would take to run out. Uh, same thing as currently pending jobs. The pending jobs at the time of when you queried it would show how long or what kind of usage is in the future if everything runs until it's requested uh, runtime. Um, um, but right now we don't have things like the, the memory um, of those currently running jobs or the pending so because we don't know what they actually use and those things we're trying to, to get uh, through other methods other than, than how the scheduler is, is um, pulling resources. Okay, so now that, now that I'm in here, I'm just going to actually uh, load the modules I need. And I'm just going to follow the, the readme line by line. I have this virtual environment I have to source it. And then I'm going to start this interactive job.
So this interactive job, I'll just put my account name in. And then that will run the notebook so for resources. The interactive jobs tend to start pretty quickly. I see here which compute node it started on. So this is the compute node that I'm going to want to um, create a, a tunnel to. Okay, so these resources become ready. It's the job has gone to Graham and uh, is now uh, running on the system. And then we have here the the node as well as as the token that we want to run. So in another terminal, I'm just gonna follow these instructions where I'm going to create a tunnel. And this tunnel is to gram uh, 649 via 888. And then uh, this is through the login node. So now that that's running, so in this terminal, we have the interactive job that's running uh, the notebook. And then I've created a tunnel to get to the compute node through the login node. And then all that we have to do is um, open a new browser that actually might as well just so. We're going to go through the local host, start with right here, and then we're going to follow it to this token, which is notebook. And then that should start the Jupyter Lab interactive view of this notebook. So this is now the state that anybody, uh, any user would have access to these same uh, resources at this point. Uh, so this interactive job will run for three hours um, from my accounts project workspace on the Gram system. And then we can also just run this on any of the, um, any, of the clusters in, in the identical way once it's set up and running. So I think that's all that I have to demonstrate. Um, once, once that's started, it knows the kernel. You can just run the imports. And then from there, I should just be able to run the query and then generate that jobs to give me. So I can just go through this again, but this part I've already uh, demonstrated. So moving forward, we're basically just going to be adding uh, an actual sequence of procedures of different views um, that uh, staff run to identify known issues. And then we'll start adding this uh, to the, uh, the wiki uh, for users to be able to follow the same process uh, for assessing wait times that we typically use when dealing with tickets or dealing with the alerts that we uh, generate um, uh, for staff to identify issues like this. And then maybe I'll follow up with another presentation with that specific process once we get it documented. So I don't think I have anything else. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in chat or just unmute and uh, join in.